to our friends in Asia and good morning to our honored speaker from USA. Welcome back to another educative session of ACNS webinars. Today we have two very learned faculties who are going to teach us about their respective subspecialities. The first speaker for today needs no introduction to you as he is an orator par excellence. He is an integral part of the online education in neurosurgery. Ladies and gentlemen, it's my great honor to introduce you to Professor James K. Liu. Professor Liu is the Professor of Neurological Surgery, Director of Cerebrovascular Skull Base and Pituitary Surgery. He is also the Co-Director of Endoscopic Skull Base Surgery Program and Director of Surgical Neuro-Oncology and Brain Tumor Center of the Department of Neurological Surgery and Otolaryngology, Head and Neck Surgery, Rutgers Neurological Institute of New Jersey, USA. Liu is also Secretary Treasurer of the International Meningioma Society. Professor Liu is renowned for his comprehensive treatment of complex brain tumors and skull base lesions. His robust clinical practice encompasses both traditional and open minimally invasive endoscopic endonesis skull base approaches. He also specializes in microsurgery of cerebrovascular diseases, including brain aneurysms, AVMs, cavernous malformation, carotid artery stenosis, and bypass for myoma disease. He is one of the most active researchers in his field. He has taught many hands on cadaveric dissection courses in skull base surgery and lectured extensively nationally and internationally throughout North America, Latin America, Europe, and Asia. We are indeed so grateful to Professor Liu for accepting our invitation to be a speaker at our webinars. Today, he is going to talk about transpetrosal approaches for skull based lesions, a tailored approach. The second speaker for today is our honored guest from China, Professor Yang Xingjian. Dr. Xingjian is a chief physician, doctor supervisor, and professor of Beijing Tiantan Hospital and Beijing Neurosurgical Institute. He is also the director of science and technology department and deputy director of intervention neurology department of Beijing Tiantan Hospital. He is the chairman of hemorrhagic disease treatment group of intervention neuroradiology society of Chinese medical doctor association and vice chairman of intervention neuroradiology group of neurosurgery society of Chinese medical doctor association. He has extensive experience in the treatment of intracranial aneurysm, vascular malformation, carotid cavernous fistula, dural AVFs, ischemic cerebrovascular diseases. He has published more than 50 papers in various internationally acclaimed journals. He was selected as senior technical talent of Beijing Municipal Health Bureau and winner of the National Pharmaceutical Industry Science and Technology Progress Award. We are so grateful to Professor Xinjian to have accepted our invitation to be a speaker at our webinar. Today is going to talk about embolization strategies using simulation design. The chair for today is our very learned faculty from China, Professor Ji Tang. Professor Tang is consultant, associate professor of neurosurgery of Beijing Xuanwu Hospital, Capital Medical University, China. His great interest focus on advanced imaging guided techniques in minimally invasive surgical management of brain lesions, particularly in glioma, meningioma, skull base, and brainstem lesions. He is co author of several peer review papers and member of the Skull Base Committee and Advanced Technology Committee of WFNS. He is council member of Asian Oceanic Congress of Skull Base Societies and international member of Congress of Neurological Surgeons. He is a visiting scholar of tens of world class neurological centers worldwide. We are so grateful to Professor Ji Tang to accept this invitation to chair this webinar. On behalf of the Education Committee of the ACNS and President Professor Yoko Kaito, I would like to sincerely welcome the speakers for today, Professor James K. Liu and Professor Yang Xinjian and the Chair Professor Ji Tang to this online platform of ACNS webinars. Dr. Liu Bun Seng from Malaysia is my co-host for today. With that introduction, may I please hand over the platform to Professor Ji Tang. Hello, good evening. Good evening, good morning, my friend. So I, it's a very pleasure and it's my honor to chair the, today's uh, education program. And the, the first speaker, the two speakers are my friends. The first one is James Liu, is from the New Jersey, United States. He is a very experienced and very active the skull base surgeon so far. We have uh, known each other for more than 10 years. He is an uh, author uh, for many of the, the papers published in books and chapters. It's a normal word. Uh, and today he brings us a very interesting the topic about the tailored uh, surgical approach to the pediatric level. The second speaker is also my friend. He is an endovascular, uh, uh, endovascular the neurosurgeon. So uh, that us to enjoy today's this evening's the the, the, the program. The first speaker is uh, James Liu from New Jersey, uh, America. So please, James, please. Great. Uh, thank you, Raja and. Uh... Gee, it's good to see everybody here, Suresh. Uh, thank you for the kind introduction. So I want to begin with um, this statue of uh, the Michelangelo David, which you can see in the uh, museum in Florence, Italy. And if you ever have a chance to visit Florence, uh, you must uh, visit this museum. And you take a look at the works of Michelangelo and, and the, the beauty and the art of his ability to sculpt. 
And if you walk the hallway, uh, there are a bunch of statues that uh, line the hallway up to the David statue. And, and these are so-called Michelangelo's unfinished works. And you can see how you can see the, the, the vision that he had for these works, how he's able to excavate these um, people out of the rock. And I think when we think about the temporal bone, we have to be like Michelangelo and we have to be like architects and, and archaeologists where we're able to envision the structures within the temporal bone and excavate them uh, uh, to visualize these um, important structures because this is the key to understanding the temporal bone and, and getting access to deep lesions of the CP angle and petroclival region. And so when we think about trans Petrus approaches, I, I like this illustration from uh, Dr. Van Loveren and Dr. Tu's atlas. And we can divide the clivus into various zones. And I've adopted the, the approach that Jacques Morcos has taught me, which is dividing the clivus into fourths. And if you take the upper fourth, which is from the dorsum cellae to uh, the confluence of the venous sinuses, you can access this region readily through an FTOZ or subtemporal. And as you get lower on the clivus between the fifth and seventh nerves, the colossus or the anterior petrosal approach gets you to this region nicely. And to get lower, you can combine it with a posterior petrosal. And the lower one fourth of the clivus below the jugular foramen is generally accessed through a far lateral transcondylar approach. And of course, the workhorse to get to the CP angle is the retrosigmoid approach. And more um, novel approaches coming from the midline, let's not forget the extended endoscopic and the nasal approaches to get to the total clivus uh, uh, medially. So I think the transpetrosal approaches continue to remain important approaches in skull based surgery. Uh, there are many proponents that argue that the retrosigmoid approach um, can be done for almost anything. And I believe while that is true, the transpetrosal approaches continue to give us versatile access and variable angles of attack to various lesions of the skull base while minimizing brain retraction and brainstem retraction. And I'll show you some many case examples why this is important. When we think about the transpetrosal approaches, it, I like to break it down into anterior petrosal, which is commonly known as the Kawasis approach, which is primarily through a subtemporal craniotomy, drilling the petrous apex and dropping through the pentorium. So it gives you a middle fossa to posterior fossa trajectory. And then the posterior petrosal approach is really access through a mastoidectomy and, and subtemporal craniotomy. And by cutting the tentorium, you get a pre-sigmoidal avenue to the skull base. And you can combine both of these. Uh, this is the, the anatomical view of the Kawasis approach. So to understand the Kawasis approach, you can get access to the brainstem and you're working primarily between the fifth and the seventh nerves. And you can preserve the facial nerve function and cochlea and hearing function if you keep these structures intact. So what are some indications for the anterior petrosal? You can commonly get to cholesterol granulomas, chondrosarcomas and chordomas and meningiomas, and of course, some vascular lesions, including brainstem cavernomas that present itself anterolaterally to the surface of the pons. And we can also open up the fibrous ring of the trigeminal nerve, which really opens up Meckel's cave, which gives you access to Meckel's cave lesions as well. I think the most important thing to understand about the Kawasis approach is that I think it's often poorly misunderstood. Uh, many people would try to resect this lesion through a retrosigmoid approach, but look how the brainstem is wrapped or the brain, the peduncle, middle cerebral of peduncle and the cerebellum is wrapped around the tumor. And this was a epidermoid tumor that I had resected through a retrosigmoid approach. 
but this area I had difficulty visualizing because the retrosigmoid approach gives you the line of access along the Petrus Ridge. So when there is brain wrapped around, you cannot get to this unless there's excessive retraction in the cerebellum. And I can tell you that working here, the seventh nerve was under stretch around the backside of this tumor, and there was a lot of irritation to the facial nerve monitor. So I came back at this second stage through a Kawasi's approach, and it gave you beautiful anterior to posterior access to this area uh, of the CP angle with this type of viewing trajectory. So we can do this through either a frontotemporal or middle fossa craniotomy. And uh, this is the general approach that I use. This was um, illustrated in Fukushima's atlas with a frontotemporal incision. And you can also have the option of dropping down the zygoma to make the temporal muscle lower. Although I don't think you necessarily need to do this in all cases. Um, but to understand the middle fossa, you have to understand the Fukushima rhomboid. And I think this landmark is very useful in understanding how to navigate the middle fossa. So as you're peeling the middle fossa, dura, you want to divide the middle meningeal artery at the foramen spinosum and peel the dura from posterior to anterior so that the GSPN lays flat uh, onto the skull base. And the landmarks that you'll identify within the rhomboid surfaces are the back of V3, the GSPN, the arcuate eminence, which most often correlates with the superior semicircular canal and the medial petrous ridge. And once you identify this rhomboid, uh, You'll see here, this is a cadaver dissection showing this rhomboid where we've peeled off the middle fossa dura after ligating and dividing frame and spinosum, the middle meningeal artery. Here is the rhomboid shaped in red. Again, it's V3, GSPN, arcuate eminence, and medial petrous ridge. Laterally, this will be Glasscox triangle, which is frame and spinosum, V3, and geniculate ganglion. And if you bisect the angle, where the geniculate ganglia meets. Anteromedially, this is called the cochlear angle where the cochlea will reside. So you must leave generally about four to five millimeters of bone over the cochlea to preserve the hearing. But once you access this, you know where the safe zones of drilling are, which is generally uh, anterior and medially. And as you go out laterally, you have to be mindful of where the petrus carotid artery is and the cochlea. And to find the, the facial nerve um, and the cochlea nerves in the IAC, you follow this uh, bisecting angle. So once you've drilled out the, the dura, you'll see that there's a fold of dura which correlates to the IAC dura. And anterior to this will be the clivus. And the inferior limit of drilling will be the inferior petrosal sinus. And then it's important to maximize the drilling posteriorly to get as close to the arcuate eminence as possible. This space posterior to the IAC is often um, <clears throat> under-recognized. <clears throat> this area is called the postmeatal triangle. Anteriorly, this is the premeatal triangle. You must maximize this space in order to really maximize your exposure to the Kawasi's approach. You could mobilize V3 anteriorly, sometimes even decompress the frame and ovale uh, with a drill to mobilize V3 and drill off more bone of the petrous apex, which is underneath V3. And in some cases, uh, you can uh, transect the GSPN uh, and mobilize the carotid canal out of the skull base and drill the rest of this area. And this is useful in some cases of uh, chondrosarcomas that invade the skull base uh, below the ICA. And so this is a, a cadaver study we did some years ago uh, when I was uh, Dr. Coldwell's resident at Utah. And we published this anatomical study exposing the Petrus ICA uh, in preparation to do this 
Fukushima bypass, which is a Petrus ICA to supraclinoid high flow vein graft bypass. Uh, unfortunately, we don't do this bypass uh, really anymore these days because this was done largely for cavernous sinus aneurysms, which is now largely treated by flow diverting and stenting techniques. But uh, this approach is useful for exposing the ICA. And when you're going intradurally, uh, you open the dura at the temporal base and then cut the dura of the posterior fossa dura, ligate the superior petrosal sinus, and you can continue the cut through the tentorium, through the tentorial edge. And when you're cutting this tentorium, be very careful to identify the fourth nerve and make sure the cut is behind the insertion of the fourth nerve. And once this is cut, things will open up and you get direct access to the brain stem between the fifth and the seventh nerves and also above and below the fourth nerve. And so here's a cadaveric study that we did some years ago that shows this beautiful exposure to the brain stem between the fifth and seventh nerves. And as you open up Meckel's cave, you can also expose Dorello's canal. Here's the basilar artery. Here's Meckel's cave. And here's an example of, of a tumor. This is a video we published some years ago showing a upper petroclival meningioma. You can see there's a CP angle component and then there's a component above the tentorium within Meckel's cave. Uh, I considered this a true petroclival meningioma because the definition is that its location is medial to the trigeminal nerve. So you can see here's the trigeminal nerve. The tumor is medial to the nerve. If you come at it retrosigmoid, the nerve would be in the way of the surgeon and the tumor. But if you come at it through a Kawasi's approach, which well, I will sh show you here, this will bring you directly right on top of the tumor. So the early steps here are division of the middle meningeal artery uh, using sharp dissection, and then peeling the middle fossa dura off of the floor in a posterior to anterior fashion to identify the GSPN. And as you get to uh, where GSPN meets V3, uh, you use sharp dissection so that you can expose V3 and peel the dura propria, which is the lateral wall of the cavernous sinus. And it becomes quite adherent here, so you must use some sharp dissection with a, a feather blade or uh, sharp scissors to incise these uh, fibrous periosteal adhesions. And then it, it will drop into a, a nice uh, sweet zone where you can start to do the peeling of the dura propria off of V3. So here I am drilling the uh, foramen ovale to decompress V3. There's foramen ovale. And now we can uh, expose the middle fossa rhomboid. We have our landmarks and surfaces of the rhomboid. I can visualize where IAC is going to be. So now I'll start the drilling like a boomerang shape from anterior to medial. Mobilize V3. This will drop into the uh, Gasserian depression and then I can drill off the remainder of the Petrus apex in order to maximize my corridor for the Kawasi's approach. Again, it's important to expose the postmeatal triangle, which is often under-recognized. We now visualize the tumor above the tentorium under this subtemporal window. We'll debulk the tumor, follow it to the tentorial edge, and then we can begin to peel it off of the brainstem structures. And then here you'll see uh, the petrosal vein uh, that's uh, uh, entering the tentorium. We'll identify where the fourth nerve is, and then we'll begin our uh, tentorial cutting uh, after we identify the free edge. So debulking the tumor is very important. Now we'll cut the tentorium uh, this time we'll start from medial to lateral, and then you can also go from lateral to medial. Here's the bleeding from the superior petrosal sinus. You can use clips, or you could sometimes just coagulate the opening and seal off the opening of the superior petrosal sinus, and then open up the posterior fossa dura, and then continue the cut to the free edge of the incisura, 
We'll extend the posterior fossa dura cutting to expose more of the posterior fossa. And then here is the superior petrosal vein. We're going to ligate it right where it enters the tentorium so we can preserve the other flow uh, on passage flow. And this step is very important here is to incise the fibrous ring of the porous trigeminus. This opens up the fifth nerve going into Meckel's cave and Gasserium ganglia. And you can see the tumor extends into Meckel's cave. We have a beautiful view of Meckel's cave. And we are now working directly on the tumor away from the fifth nerve. Whereas if you come from retrosigmoid, you would have this view where the fifth nerve is in front of the tumor. But here we're working, this approach gives us the access to the tumor directly anterior to the fifth nerve, anterior to the seventh nerve. So there's no risk to the seventh nerve here. So we can carefully peel the tumor away from the brainstem after debulking it. We can deliver it away from Meckel's cave. And then again, when you're doing meningioma surgery, it's about preserving this arachnoid membrane and peeling the membrane away from the tumor capsule. There's the basilar artery. Here's the brain stem. There's the fifth nerve kept intact. And now we we'll do a multi-layered repair with the layer of duragen, followed by a little fat graft, and then a surge cell. And I harvest a vascularized pedicled pericranial flap at the beginning of surgery, it's pedicled posteriorly, and then you can swing this into the field to seal off the defect and uh, complete the surgery. Here's the post-op MRI, and she was uh, neurologically intact. This is a case of a dumbbell schwannoma. Notice how there's a Meckel's cave component and a significant CP angle component. So I I would think uh, most people would probably do this retrosigmoid, which is certainly a very favorable approach. You can do a retrosigmoid with a supramedial tubercle drilling as popularized by Professor Sami. Um, but my preference is to come from above through a Kawasis because I feel like you get better access to Meckel's cave, which I'll show you in this video. In this case, I uh, drop the zygoma down to do a transzygomatic exposure. Again, we do the drilling of the Kawasi's triangle as demonstrated in the previous video, maximizing the window of the pre and uh, post meatal triangles. We'll open the posterior fossa dura and cut the uh, uh, superior petrosal sinus and the tentorium to the free edge. And then here we'll open up the fibrous ring uh, of the porous trigeminus to access the Meckel's cave. Here is the fifth nerve going into the Gasserian ganglion. And then we can start to dissect the tumor away from the neurovascular structures. It's important to debulk the tumor, but it's also important to identify where the fifth nerve is. Here's the seventh and eighth nerves right here coming in at this angle. You can see how the seventh and eighth nerves are not in our way when you come from this approach because you land in front of the nerves. Now, in this case, it's a trigeminal schwannoma, so you, you have to preserve as many of the trigeminal fascicles as much as possible in order to avoid any anesthesia dolorosa, facial dysthesia complications. So we're separating the tumor from the trigeminal nerve, and you can see great access to the tumor, Meckel's cave, and uh, complete removal of the tumor. Here's Meckel's cave. It's completely empty. You get beautiful access to Meckel's cave. And here's the post-op scan. The patient was neurologically intact with the exception of mild numbness to the face. Now here's the example of the large epidermoid tumor. You can see how the tumor indents into the brainstem, into the cerebellum, into the middle cerebellar peduncle. If I were to come at this through a retrosigmoid approach, I can get everything along the plane of the petrous ridge, all the way to the tip of the tumor. But the area back here is going to be very difficult to expose unless I crank on the cerebellum and retract it and or even go through the cerebellum to get this part of the tumor. So 
I ended up doing a retro sigmoid approach initially. And you can see here's the ninth and 10th nerves. Here's the seventh nerve. And uh, unfortunately here I injured the sixth nerve and I didn't realize it until I was irrigating at the end of the surgery and I saw this nerve. And since it's the sixth nerve, you must find the other end of the sixth nerve and you must repair it at all costs because the sixth nerve recovers very nicely. So here I find the two ends of the sixth nerve and uh, I truly believe that you should try to put a suture in it because uh, you must keep the, the nerve ends intact. Some people just put some Surgicel and glue, but once you fill the cistern with uh, saline and fluid again, it risks the nerve uh, from floating around. So uh, I think it's important to try to put a suture. This is a Tenno suture uh, that we're using and uh, you only need one suture and uh, do a few knots usually uh, two or three knots is adequate and then you can put some surgicel and fibrin glue and lay the nerve on the petrous bone you can see this nerve is very long it's very stretched by the tumor we'll use an endoscope to look around and you could see i couldn't reach around the corner of the cerebellum to see that residual tumor and um Here you could see this is the residual tumor that was left and after a few months the um, patient's uh, sixth nerve started to recover and at seven months it was fully uh, functional again. She was able to look in all directions. And of course this residual tumor started to grow at nine months post-op so now my option now was to come at this through a Kawasi's approach because this gives you a better angle to this area and here is the drilling of the middle fossa rhomboid. I extended this to combine it with a uh, mini posterior petrosal uh, to get better access. Here's the otic capsule and this gave me more posterior access uh, to the cerebellum and the posterior fossa. Here's the fourth nerve cutting the tentorium and then after cutting the tentorium here's the fifth nerve and then here's the epidermoid tumor just above uh, anterior to the cerebellum where the cerebellum was wrapped around the tumor but you see how this Kawasi's approach unlike the retro sigmoid approach gives you an anterior to posterior view of the brainstem so I'm not retracting the cerebellum at all here's the tumor Here's the tumor uh, behind the seventh and eighth nerves. And then the tumor is peeled off of the seventh and eighth nerves. Here's the seventh and eighth nerves. Again, it's we're working anterior to the nerves rather than uh, posterior to the nerves. And then we're able to see, here's the sixth nerve that was repaired. You can see it's healed very nicely. There's the basilar artery. And then here's the fifth nerve uh, intact. So we were able to now get a complete removal uh, and, and preserve her functions. So let's talk a little bit about the petrosal approach, the posterior petrosal. Again, it's a pre-sigmoid exposure. You do a temporal occipital craniotomy with a mastoidectomy. <clears throat> this is from Dr. Al Mefti's uh, illustration. You can see how you can preserve the otic capsule and get um, <clears throat> multiple variable angles of attack, whether you come subtemporal or pre-sigmoid. <clears throat> this is an example. <clears throat> this is an example of a brainstem cavernoma. This uh, patient was uh, treated at a previous hospital with a retrosigmoid approach and then surprisingly an endoscopic transclival approach and there was still incomplete removal of the cavernoma he had repeated hemorrhages and he came to my center for treatment you could see he's having multiple progressive 
six through eight cranial nerve palsies with hemiparesis of the right arm and leg. And when I look at the scan, you look for where the cavernoma comes to the surface. So it comes to the surface right at the anterolateral brainstem. So to me, this is a very nice access coming this angle with the Kawasis approach. Here's the DVA going into the brainstem, so you must preserve this. So I did a combined patrosal. I used his previous retrosigmoid incision and extended it. We harvest a pericranial flap. And uh, here is the peeling of the middle fossa dura. Here's the GSPN. We're going to peel the dura uh, off of the GSPN, dissecting it from posterior to anterior, and divide the middle meningeal artery. And then you can readily control the, uh, the venous bleeding with surgiflow and then begin the drilling of the petrous apex. Here we combine it with the mini mastoidectomy. We'll expose the lateral canal within the uh, antrum and then skeletonize the otic capsule. Here you can see here's the otic capsule, superior canal, posterior canal, lateral canal. <clears throat> and then complete the Kawasis drilling by drilling this area of the post meatal triangle. So it's nice to identify the superior canal because now you can maximize the drilling as close to the superior canal as possible. So we'll go ahead and open the dura uh, and then uh, cut the tentorial edge. So you have to remember to identify the fourth nerve <clears throat> Here we're opening the uh, posterior fossa dura. <coughs> and here's the superior patrosal sinus, which we're going to ligate. And then there's the fourth nerve. We lift up the tentorial edge to find the fourth nerve. And then finish the cutting behind the entrance of the fourth nerve to now expose the trigeminal nerve. You can see the trigeminal nerve is pushed closer to the dural exposure by previous surgeries, scar tissue. And we tried to open up the pre-sigmoid corridor, but because the patient had previous retrosigmoid surgery, there was extensive scar tissue here. So I abandoned the pre-sigmoid window and I tried to remove everything through the Kawasis window here. And you can see this is the exophytic component of the cavernoma. It gives you direct access to the uh, lesion. You can follow the lesion into the brainstem and uh, do piecemeal resection of the cavernoma. And uh, luckily the hematoma had a very nice exophytic component to the lower aspect of the CP angle. And um, we can follow this down. Now, when a patient has a recurrence, multiple surgeries, usually the cavernoma is not in one piece and it's been separated and there's almost like tumor seeding, right? It's like seeding of the cavernoma. Another piece grows in a different area. So I looked for the image guidance and also the hemosiderin stained part of the brainstem. So now I'm working above and below the fifth nerve and I found more cavernoma uh, that was residual. So we're going to remove the rest of this cavernoma. And because this was a previous surgery, the, the adhesions was very fibrous. So it was very important to use sharp dissection with micro scissors. Um, and you can see here's the, uh, the final view. This is very fibrous, uh, almost like calcified uh, lesion from scar tissue. So you have to use sharp dissection use uh, good micro scissors to trim and shave the adhesions uh, from the surrounding brainstem. It's, there's the DVA. This is the, the one going right down the middle of the brainstem. So you must preserve this to avoid venous infarct. And I always like to use an endoscope to look down inside the depths of the corridor to inspect. There's no further cavernoma. There's the fifth nerve. There's the DVA in the brainstem. There's the fourth nerve and a, a complete removal. 
And this is the CT scan showing the variable angles to come either anterior or posterior petrosal, saving the otic capsule. Here's the complete removal of the cavernoma. And he's been about three years recurrence free now. He's now a, a motivational speaker and uh, he wrote a, a book about his experience. This is a petroclival meningioma, a large tumor compressing the brainstem involving Meckel's cave. Again, I prefer to do this through a combined petrosal approach, harvesting a large pedicled pericranial flap and exposing the otic capsule for the pre-sigmoid window. And then here we are, we're drilling the the uh, pre-sigmoid window, skeletonizing the otic capsule. I'll often blue line the semicircular canals. And then now we're drilling the anterior petrous apex, opening the dura in the subtemporal window, connecting it to the pre-sigmoid window. Here you're going to ligate the superior petrosal sinus. Here we're using a suture ligature uh, to ligate the superior petrosal sinus. You have to be mindful and be watchful of the veins of LeBay in the subtemporal window so you don't uh, injure them subtemporally. And so now we're uh, identifying the seventh and eighth nerves right there. And then here's the tumor uh, at the petroclival region. We can peel it away from the brainstem, away from the seventh and eighth nerves. Fortunately, this tumor was soft. So we're now completing the excision of the tentorium towards the petrous apex. And then there's the fifth nerve. So you see how this approach gets us right into Meckel's cave. We're working in front of the fifth nerve rather than behind the fifth nerve. We're working in front of the seventh nerve rather than behind the seventh nerve. And I think this is the concept you have to understand when you do transpetrosal versus retrosigmoid. And uh, a lot of people criticize the transpetrosal approaches as being a morbid approach. Well, morbidity is not defined by the, the approach and, and the length of time to get there. Morbidity is, should be defined by whether you're going to injure the brain or the cranial nerves during the tumor dissection. So if you can tailor your approach so it gives you the best access to do the safest neurovascular dissection from critical structures, then in my mind, that approach has a lower morbidity. So here's the final view. We'll do the multi-layered repair with the multi uh, fascial lata fat graft and uh, rotate it with a pericranial graft at the end. So this is the repair I use. This is for translab or pre-sigmoid dural defects. It's called a fascial sling technique, which we published. So you suture a piece of fascia, so it's like a tent or like a hammock. And then you could lay the fat on top of the, the, the dural sling and then buttress it with a, a plate or, or a medpore uh, a plate to push the graft to seal it off. Again, here's the multiple corridors uh, through the petrous bone using a combined approach this is the immediate post-op MRI, and this is the three-month delayed MRI after everything is healed. And she did great from this, was neurologically intact with preserved facial and hearing functions. So this is a trigeminal schwannoma. We just published this in operative neurosurgery. This is a large trigeminal schwannoma invading into Meckel's cave. And this we did through a combined petrosal approach. Uh, here you could see the temporal bone has been drilled out, preserving the otic capsule. <clears throat> We're cutting the presigmoid and subtemporal corridor, ligating the superior petrosal sinus, cutting the superior petrosal sinus, and cutting the tentorium to the free edge. And here's the arachnoid dissection, opening the cistern. Here we're visualizing the tumor. And there's the trigeminal nerve, the cisternal segment. And we can also stimulate it to ensure that it's not the facial nerve. And then stimulate the tumor 
to ensure a safe zone of debulking. So we'll start to debulk the tumor with a, an ultrasonic aspirator. And once the tumor is debulked, we can start peeling it from the brainstem. We can now visualize the seventh and eighth nerves here below the tumor. So we're working below seventh and fifth nerves. We can start the peeling of the tumor from the brainstem, peel it away from the seventh and eighth nerves. And uh, schwannomas tend to be softer tumors, so these are easy to debulk. Um, fortunately, this one was not terribly vascular. So we'll finish cutting of the tentorium, and we can cut the tentorium through the porous trigeminus to follow the tumor into Meckel's cave. And then here's the remainder of the tumor. This is the most anterior component of the tumor. Here's the fourth nerve just under the temporal lobe. Here's opening the porous trigeminus to follow the tumor into Meckel's cave. The beauty of this approach, I think, is you get great access to Meckel's cave. You can mobilize the fifth nerve and work in front or behind it. And then here's the remainder part of the tumor. And here's the basal or artery, peeling the tumor away. I like to use these very small micro patties, delicate patties. These are excellent for skull base surgery. And there's the basal artery. Here's the endoscopic view of the resection bed. Here you can see the abducens nerve, the basal artery, and here is the seventh and eighth nerves. And I left a very small tumor adherence uh, to the, to the uh, uh, nerve. So this was a near total resection pre-op, post-op, the patient was neurologically intact. And um, I want to show you um, one case of a, a deep cerebellar AVM. This AVM was being fed by the distal SCA vessel. And although you can do this retrosigmoid, uh, I felt that the Kawasi and Petrozal approach gets you a wider field of view, a wider exposure, and better control of the SCA vessel. Because this is the surgical view that you will have coming from a combined petrosal approach. Here's the, um, here's the approach. Let me just skip down to the AVM resection. So this is the view you get uh, of the dura, intradural exposure. And uh, here is the uh, SCA vessel here. And there's a tiny feeder going into this AVM. You can see this vein that's arterialized now becomes blue. And to find the AVM, we use the image guidance, but we can also follow the hemosiderin stained brain. And this is not a big AVM, this is a micro AVM. But as you may know, small AVMs can also be treacherous, particularly if they are posterior fossa AVMs. So uh, don't think these are uh, not treacherous lesions. So these are uh, resectable, can be surgically treated. And then here are the small feeders in the resection bed. Here's the last feeder being removed. There's the AVM uh, being delivered. And you could see how this approach gets you right, lands you right on top of the AVM. And you're not working in a deep corridor. The post-op angio is negative. So we can do different variations of the posterior approach depending on the hearing status. So if the hearing is intact, you can do retro lab. You can still preserve hearing by doing a transcrucial or what's called a partial lab, taking away the superior and posterior canals <clears throat> and then if the hearing is out and impaired you can uh, do a trans lab get better uh, view of the petroclival region and of course if you mobilize the facial nerve you can drill out the rest of the cochlea and do a total petrosectomy we rarely do this now because this tends to result in a facial palsy that only recovers to a brachman 3 but you can do this uh, transcrucial approach by drilling off the superior and posterior canals. This was popularized by uh, Delashaw and also Professor Shekhar, this PLPA approach. 
And we did this through uh, approach for this large petroclival meningioma extending into Meckel's cave, because this gives you more exposure. Notice how this brainstem is wrapped around the back of the tumor. So retrosigmoid approach for this tumor would be, in my mind, a terrible approach because you would result in excessive retraction of the brainstem and most likely leave residual tumor in this corner. Whereas coming from petrosal, this gives you an anterior view, a posterior view, and the result is to get this excellent decompression of the brainstem. We were able to preserve the hearing and facial nerve and she was neurologically intact. So to conclude here, I believe the transpetrosal approaches still remain important strategies in our armamentarium for both skull-based and vascular lesions. Sometimes it can provide you a more advantageous angle of attack to the brainstem. And like Michelangelo or an archeologist, we have to master the temporal bone uh, when we're doing these approaches. And I, again, thank you for this opportunity to speak uh, uh, for, for the ACNS, and I appreciate your attention. Thank you very much. Thank you, James. So I, I love the, your, your very the wonderful, very nice the presentations and the emphasize about the surgical approach for the, the challenging the lesions in the petroclavo the regions. And also, you're very defined the tech, but 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 I, I have a little bit the uh, the comment for this with the evolution of the skull base. I think the, this uh, the transpetrosal the traumatization we can change a little bit maybe to the small trauma. Maybe we can use the endoscope, and we can minimize the surgical approach. So in the future, maybe we can decrease the surgical approach like this the combined approach, transpetrosal, and uh, maybe sometimes a subtemporal approach and uh, a, a tailored uh, drilling of the anterior, the petrosal, the apex is also a way we can decrease the injury and we can shorten, maybe we can shorten the surgical time. What's your comment about the uh, endoscope in the future uh, for our the skull base in the petroclavo as uh, a legions gems? Yeah, I think uh, I think the endoscope is a wonderful tool. Um, I think it's very useful when you're doing any CP angle surgery. I, I use it routinely <clears throat> with the microscope, as you can see in the videos. I, I think. When you're using the endoscope, um, you know, some people are using endoscope through the ear canal itself to remove small acoustic schwannomas. I'm, I'm not in favor of that approach. I think it's um, to remove a small tumor. You can either treat with radiosurgery or you can do a retrosigmoid or middle fossa and not risk a CSF leak through the ear canal. And some people have, are also using endonasal approach to petroclival meningiomas. And in my opinion, I think the endonasal approach is more morbid than doing a standard transtemporal approach because you avoid the nasal morbidity, you avoid the risk of CSF rhinorrhea. And I think you get a better uh, exposure of the tumor uh, and cranial nerve safety coming from a lateral approach. That's just my opinion. I think your access to get a complete removal is better from a lateral approach. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for a wonderful slide and the, uh, the demonstration about the surgery for the, this challenge case. Thank you. So because the time is limited, I have to move to the next speaker. Thank you. The next speaker is uh, Professor Yang Xinjian. He's an endovascular neurosurgeon, and his topic about the high techniques, about the evaluations, and assess about the aneurysms. So now um, we are the invite of Professor Yang Xinjian to give us uh, his uh, the lectures. Dear colleagues, uh, thanks Dr. Xu Bing to invite invitation, and thanks the moderator, Dr. Kuti, Dr. Song, Tang, Dr. Lin, and uh, I'm Dr. Yang Xinjian from Tiantan. I'm the 
Beijing Surgical Institute. I'm from Beijing Tiantan Hospital and the Beijing Medical Beijing Neurosurgical Institute. Now, <coughs> when we met a patient with aneurysm in the outpatient department, we also we, we often ask two questions. One is treatment or observation. The other is how to do, how to treat, how to design the treatment. Uh, often we we decide uh, the, the, we get the answer from the, our knowledge uh, the, from the knowledge of hemodynamics or multivariation analysis from clinical data uh, and this these two kind of information can form the ai uh, ai tools to to help us decide to decide uh, the, the, the resolution of the aneurysm First, I talk about it, the hemodynamics. Uh, as you know, hemodynamics play a very important role in aneurysm in initiation, growth rupture, and the recurrence. Uh, previously, many paper uh, uh, answer that uh, answer these questions. Uh, we know. Uh, recurrence rate after embolization is a big problem, very big problem. Uh, also criticized by our colleagues from open surgery. Uh, the, the, the data up to six to 30 uh, percent. Residue, residual energy still has rupture risk. And uh, we, uh, we have a uh, hypothesis that hemodynamic factors can play a very important role for recognition. Uh, here is our, is our retrospective analysis of partial in blood cases. You can see a high flow velocity and the wear shear stress uh, at the residual neck after implantation here can associate with the recurrence, recurrence here. And uh, in, uh, in other paper in the published in the Journal of Neurosurgery, a uh, retrospective analysis of totally implant cases that we show a low velocity and well shear stress at neck region were associated with favorable outcome, favorable outcome. How about the standard system calling cases? We can see that uh, the velocity on the neck, the lower the, the velocity, the lower the rate of recurrence. Uh, <clears throat> we do a, uh, we publish a GIS a paper that the first large sample study with over 200 cases. Uh, we, we, we do some CFD simulation. And we found that a large size reduction of the re ratio of velocity of neck were independent factors of recurrence. But, our, but these cases is not, have not included cases of flow diverter cases. Here we, we can show the recurrence case that upper implantation, we can still uh, hear that there is a high velocity uh, on the neck, so we, this induced uh, recurrence or, or recurrentization after the embolization. On the contrary, in the stable cases uh, after the embolization, there is no uh, high flow jet here. So what should we, we do next? Uh, we, uh, the previous study, most of the previous studies are retrospective design, and uh, we have we, we should have a high level evidence for prospective study. So we we, we registered a, a clinical trial in the in, in the in, in the website, and this is the first prospective prospective registry study of the aneurysm recognition. And uh, we focused the hemodynamic effect of the 
in the Wefka treatment. Here is the inclusion criteria and the exclusion criteria. Angiographic e uh, evaluation by independent angiographic committee. We divided the, two, the, the cases in two, two groups. One group is uh, conventional treatment. That's the call, calling or uh, stand assisted, call, assisted calling. The other group is flow diversion group. We do the angiogram follow up routinely at four months and one year after treatment. And the, the, the two groups were divided, divided according to the angiogram follow up. The, 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 the first group is favorable outcome, favorable outcome. The other is unfavorable outcome. But for the conventional treatment and the fluid diversion treatment, the, the criteria is not the same. We have enrolled over 200 cases and the patient, many multi-risk multi -risk factors accessed by uh, univariate analysis and independent factors can be accessed by multivariate uh, hybrid regression. We have the hemodynamics uh, evaluation and the morphology evaluation and the clinic factor evaluation. Here we used a, a, a tool for advanced virtual staging technique developed by, uh, developed by Buffalo, Buffalo, uh, Buffalo University. And this is, uh, we can, these pictures show we can uh, simulate almost all kinds of stand using use EMR practice. Has an enterprise solitary airways pipeline. Here we show the, <clears throat> how we simulated the in blood cases. Here, the, the red part is, is calling, is called the part of the aneurysm, uh, made, made a model of porous media. Here is a residual, residual neck. Here is the standard parent artery. The inflow, inflow boundary condition was set patient specifically to obtain more accurate result. Every patient has his own data. Uh, so in one, in one year, we enrolled more than 200 cases with 100, 217 algorithms. The unfavorable outcome group, we have 13% uh, of cases unfavorable, in, uh, in unfavorable outcome group. We have 86% in uh, favorable outcome. This is a short time result. This is a half time, uh, three months, uh, half months, uh, uh, half a year uh, uh, angiogram result. Among the 23 aneurysm with unfavorable outcome, uh, we have two cases retreated and three uh, conservative, conservative treatment and uh, Eight with further midterm follow up. Here is a basic characteristic of short term follow up. So, uh, between the favorable outcome and the unfavorable outcome, the two groups, uh, the, the age and gender and the smoking, this data have no difference, have no difference. For on, uh, morphology for short term follow up, uh, including annual size. There's also no difference between two sides, the two groups, between two groups. Uh, interestingly, uh, for the clinical factors for short time follow up, treatment therapy and the packing density have, no, have also counting impact in the, in the result of immobilization. There are no difference between two groups, favorable outcome and unfavorable outcome. But, but we can, Surprisingly, we can find that hemodynamic for short time follow up, we can see that reduction ratio of velocity at the aneurysm neck, the, the, there is a difference between the two groups, the favorable outcome and unfavorable outcome. There's significant difference between the two groups. 
and uh, using the multivariate regression, we can also show that uh, the, the, the re reduction ratio of velocity at annuals and neck, this is an independent factor associated with your canalization. <clears throat> we made an ROC curve that we can show the threshold of, of the uh, threshold is 46%. If we have a ratio, re reduction ratio of the velocity at the, at, at, at the neck, up to uh, four, 46%, uh, we, can get a, uh, we can get a favorable outcome. So for the middle term one year result, you can, we can see the similar result and favorable outcome is 12% and a favorable outcome is 87%. Also the same, also the similar result that reduction ratio of velocity at the, at the neck is an independent factor associated with, or social it with the result. The, the threshold value is 48% in the middle term result. So what's the strength of study? This is a prospective study and this is a large sample size. And we can include all the kind, all kinds of technical skills, a virtual stand, a stand and then a power media. We can include all, all kinds of treatment strategy and device, including calling and including uh, uh, calling by, by stand, calling assisted by stand and the pipeline. How to, exp how to interpret this result? We can just, we can ju uh, why just hemodynamic factor remained after logistic regression? Others have, uh, is not the independent factors. Pre in previous study, we can show that any, any room size neck wise, neck, neck wise were predictors in the, in the recurrence. Uh, any room larger than 10 millimeter have high risk of recurrence. But the size did not show significance in our present study. <clears throat> Why? Because, sorry, sorry, because after application of new devices, the treatment decision have more choice. We can select clear, we can select the, uh, the, the treatment very clear, uh, cleverly uh, and optimized. Most, uh, but most previous study, including ours, did not include flow diverted cases in, in, the, in, the, in those studies. And also, dense packing could not uh, could, could could prevent recurrence in the in the previous in the stu studies and previous manuscripts manuscripts manuscripts. But. Loose packing was used in fluid diverted cases to prevent hemorrhage and promote aneurysm occlusion. And the hemodynamics, uh, and the, in these cases, uh, dense packing is not needed anymore. Therefore, hemodynamics need more, need more attention. And uh, <clears throat> based on this, knowledge uh, and the knowledge, we can do some preoperative simulation. Here's an example, here's an example. This case is large aneurysm on the ICA treated by one pipeline, but the angiogram follow-up show incomplete occlusion after 10 months. So you can show the residual aneurysm here. But if we preoperative simulate the case, Similarly, to, to help to design the, the treatment. Here, the beside, before the treatment, if we use one pipeline, the flow the, the, the reduction rate on the neck is 31%. This is not enough, it's not enough. If we, how about deploy another uh, flow dye water? If we use two, two pipeline, flow reduction rate is 45%. Uh, but we can see 
there is there still remain a high high jet high jet flow here high jet flow here so that is not that is not enough how about use a one pipeline and coils 80% loose packing the flow reduction is 33% how about a one pipeline with more coils 50% 15% of loose packing uh, this is this is very uh, surprisingly that the, the flow reduction may up to uh, 49%, nearly 50%. So considering this the, uh, the design, we think that the best choice of the treatment is one pipeline with um, coils at least uh, at least 15% loose packing. Here is another example with an uh, aneurysm. Uh, it was treated by uh, enterprise assisted calling, but the recurrence of seven months. You can see the, the recurrence here. Here, before the treatment, and after one, one enterprise and, coil, and coils, we can see the, that flow reduction rate is only 22%. It's, it's it's fairly low compared to the to the to the good result. So we can design if we design with the preoperative simulation, if you use our airways and the and the, and the coil, the reduction is 43 percent. That's not that, that is nearly enough. Not this is nearly enough. If you use a pipeline alone. The flow reduction may be forty-three percent. If you use a pipeline and a coil, the flow reduction is fifty-two percent. So the best the best treatment may be uh, pipeline and coils. So on the uh, on the on the base of this acknowledgement, uh, on, we can develop uh, the AI system. This is can uh, help us help us to make some good decision. Yeah, the AI machine learning, uh, the stability access, access, assessment of intracranial aneurysm use uh, a machine learning. Uh, we just published uh, on the on, on the journal. We we, we access uh, we evaluation we evaluate the unstable cases. A sleep aneurysm include ruptured cases and the growth, and the cases with growth. Uh, we use the thirteen clinical features and the eighteen morpholo morphology features. Morphology features. There we use ma machine learning method. We use eighty percent, eighty percent of cases in training data, and the learning algor algorithm and learning algorithm. And make a model. We we used we used twenty percent of data cases uh, to test and uh, uh, correct the model, and this model can can use to be a predicted result. Here is the how to how the location and decide decide the fate of the aneurysm. How is it is it aneurysm stable or unstable? Here's the uh, machine, machine learning using uh, the morphology uh, status, more than 18%, 18 morphology data to evaluate the, the, if the, the and pred, predict the, the stable or unstable. We, we tried several models, uh, machine learning models, and show that the artificial neural net, network this is developed by our engineer. I, 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 I confess I don't understand fully, but we can use it very, uh, very freely. That, that artificial aneurysm, artificial neural network is the best model to use to predict the, 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 the aneurysm. So we developed, developed, developed commercial software, commercial software with, uh, with a pattern AI, you know system. This is, the, this is our 
intellectual diagnosis and the treatment system. Here we give you an example. This is this patient uh, suffers from aneurysm. Here is four aneurysm, here are four aneurysms. Which uh, we, we, we should we, we would like to know which aneurysm is, mo is the most risky and should be so resolved firstly. Here is the multiple aneurysm. We, we evaluate the aneurysm from morph uh, morphological features, uh, clinical features, and uh, hemodynamics. So we, we after evaluation, we, we, we get the result that the first aneurysm is the uh, middle risky, mid risky aneurysm. And the second aneurysm is uh, extremely high risky aneurysm. It should be uh, treated first. And the third aneurysm is very low. The risk, the risk is very low. And the fourth aneurysm, also the fourth aneurysm is, is, is a low risk aneurysm. So with the system, uh, we, uh, we, we uh, they help us to, to know which aneurysm is the, the most risky and help us to make a decision which one is, should be observed, which one should be first to treat it first, firstly. Uh, and also we, we develop, develop AI simulation technique based on the, based on the, uh, based on the machine learning and the uh, hemodynamic knowledge. Here is the standard simulation technique. So we give you an example how to, how to use the system. Here is a, a, a huge aneurysm on the uh, ICA. The, 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 the biggest the, the biggest diameter is 10, per, 10 millimeter. <clears throat> so we use the standard simulation technique to, to help us to design the treatment. So the, the, the machine, the, the, the AI recommended model, recommended a pipeline 4.5 by 25. Here is the simulation plan. And uh, here is the simulation uh, plan uh, using the hemodynamic simulation after stand, the after stand and calling before and after, before and after. Here, actually, we follow, we follow the, the, the design uh, recommended by the AI machine. So we use, uh, we use uh, some coils and uh, uh, a stand uh, 4. Point, uh, 4 .5 by 25 the same with the recommended recommended by the AI machine and get almost the same with the simulation given by AI simulation that is, here is the actual operation result almost the same with the AI simulation so if we, if, if, if you are a young doctor, is, is less experienced and uh, does not uh, uh, does not uh, know how to use the stand or how to use the coil or which size with the, uh, which size and what is the length of the uh, pipeline you, you can he can uh, learn from AI simulation here is the uh, AI simulation technique can help the, help the clinical uh, physicians to make more accurate and efficient clinical decisions to, to it may avoid some possible adverse complicated complication. And in the future, we can um, use the, uh, the, the knowledge of, of the AI system or, uh, or hemodynamic factors to detect aneurysm and make decision which one to, to observe, which one to, to be treated, and how to and help us to design the, the, uh, the treatment, to how to help us to select uh, the method and the select the stand, select the coils. Uh, they may be a very useful tools for, for, our, for our operation design. Uh, thanks and happy Chinese New Year. Thank you, Dr. Yang Xinjiang. You give us an interesting uh, topic.
about uh, the AI, and then we know the we have the very the, the big development about the the AI, the robot. So it seems in the in the future we can rely on the the AI or the robot, right? So maybe at that time we are an employee, an employed, an employed, and then the position may be occupied by machines. <laughs> because of your the endovascular the advancement, the open surgery clipping and the surgery is uh, replaced by the endovascular. And in the future, you mean that the AI, the robot, can replace all the human the beings? Well, maybe at that time, I'll be, I don't it's know. A it's a disaster. <laughs> Disaster, yeah. Employee, employee. Yeah. So so far, how much, how much you your your team, how much your team rely on on this, or or just uh, you you make a comparison about the AI or your the the doctor's decision. Uh, recently we used the uh, uh, AI, you know, system. And in, in the outpatient department, out, outpatient department, we, we make a report. We can make a report uh, for the patients and uh, help uh, help the patient and and both help both the patient and the, the doctors to decide which one should be observed and which one should be uh, treated. So uh, more and more patients uh, diagnosed by. Uh, occurrently, without rupture, without without bleeding, any aneurysm, come to our uh, outpatient department and ask how to do next, and they are afraid of the operation risk, complications, and uh, they also worry about the the bleeding, the bleeding of the aneurysm in the future. So uh, they worry worry about aneurysm every day. So the, the AI system can help both doctors and uh, patients to get a more reliable predictions and decisions. So, it, but uh, the AI design system, uh, operation design system, has just de developed and not used um, uh, much in, in 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 clinical works. But maybe uh, few in the future. Uh, we can use more. So how about the uh, AVM? AVM, you can you use this simulation, the system for the AVM, the treatment? Oh, I, can't, I, I, I think the AVM more complicated than, uh, much, much more complicated than the, the aneurysm. Aneurysm is just, 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 just a bubble. It's relatively simple for hemodynamic result, hemodynamic research. But AVM is, is so much feeding arteries and uh, draining veins and, and uh, very, very, very complex, 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 complex uh, net. So it's very difficult to to, to get a simulation. So we have not start the simulation on AVM now. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Can, can I ask some question? I can. Actually, my question is to James. Uh, James, it was an excellent overview of Petrosel approach. <laughs> you once again showed us that you are the Michael Angelo of uh, Peter's board. And you stressed the importance of uh, Petrosel approach, telling that Petrosel approaches have good anterior to posterior view of brain stem. We can work in front of the fifth and seventh nerve and also access to Meckel's cave and we can mobilize the fifth nerve. Uh, my question to you, three, four questions or just comments. Uh, so uh, like when you do a, a anterior petrosectomy, do you unroof the uh, internal auditory canal? Like what we do for uh, optic canal unroofing before doing a, a clinoid, anterior clinoid activity like that. Do you always unroof the internal auditory canal, stimulate for uh, seventh nerve before 
doing a pterostectomy. My first question. Second question is just a comment. This pterostectomy approach is excellently you demonstrated, but sixth nerve always you see at the fag end of the procedure, where you know you come from posteriorly, you decompress the tumor. You have you can see the sixth nerve at least earlier than from uh, anterior approach. And uh, my one more comment is. Uh, 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 so, if that, that approach, and you are a strong proponent of uh, pterostectomy approaches, but consistency of the tumor uh, decides to me uh, the approach because some tumor tumor gives us space. So, if we suck the tumor, decompress the tumor, uh, let's say we can easily access for, through a retrosigmoid approach. And sometimes, like you know, uh, a posterior pterostectomy approach. It's a, like if you have a mid-clival tumor in the clival pit. Mid-clival tumor means it is uh, below, fifth, above jugular tubercle in the clival pit. To access it from above is difficult. If you have posterior pitus approach, you cannot actually access, direct access to the clival pit. It is to the other side of the tumor. And uh, what are your comments for this, James? Yeah. Very nice comments. Thank you for your comments. Uh, for the first one, the unroofing of the IAC. Uh, to do an adequate Kawasi's approach, you have to unroof the proximal IAC always to get enough exposure. Do you necessarily need to skeletonize the IAC all the way out to the, uh, the fundus? Uh, not necessarily, um, you know, like a middle fossa acoustic, you have to unroof it all the way to the labyrinthine segment. You don't have to do that if your tumor is medial. So that's answer to the first question. The second question is the sixth nerve. The sixth nerve always has a variable course, but as you mentioned, the sixth nerve is always, in most cases, displaced medially, and it's usually the last structure that you see. And there's no useful landmark to pick it up proximally or distally. So it, it can be treacherous and you have to be very careful, uh, you know, when, when identifying the sixth nerve. So that can be vulnerable to injury, whether you do a petrosal approach or whether you do a retrosigmoid approach. Um, and then the consistency of the tumor, uh, that's a very good point. Um, the way I decide <clears throat> the approach is I typically look at the long axis of the tumor and whether or not which approach would give you the uh, least amount of cerebellar or brainstem retraction. So if the, the tumor is indenting the brainstem or there's significant cerebellum wrapped around the tumor, you know, my preference is to you know, do a patrosal approach to come in front of those structures to avoid uh, avoid uh, retraction. But you do mention the clival pit or, or, or the clival depression, which is very important. You know, the retrosigmoid gives you a very direct view of that because it follows the, uh, the angle of the petrous ridge right to the middle of the clivus. And the patrosal approach comes at a more lateral angle where you don't have a direct view of the clival pit. So in those cases, you may want to consider combining both uh, pre-sigmoid and retro-sigmoid approaches so you have advantages of both. Thank you. Thank you, James. Uh, yes, my co-host, Dr. Libun Singh. Yeah, hello. Uh, uh, Professor Yang, uh, I wish to ask you some question uh, regarding your study uh, comparing the recurrent rate uh, between coiling and using a uh, flow diverter. Uh, in your study, uh, do you look into the uh, inflammatory marker and also the use of aspirin that we uh, affect uh, the possibility of recurrent? And secondly, is do you study in the use of a uh, flow diverter that may reduce uh, the flow or increase the flow rate within the parent vessel that will eventually uh, re making reduction in the risk of uh, having uh, recurrent of aneurysm? And my second question to you, Prof, is on the use of AI you know. Uh, you mentioned that the, the, the machine will be able to predict uh, which aneurysm uh, will be most likely ruptured. But in cases of ruptured aneurysm, would the AI able to identify which aneurysm were ruptured? 
I mean, if in multiple aneurysm cases. Thank you, Professor. But well, uh, your second question is AI system uh, to evaluate in the outpatient uh, before uh, bef uh, erupted aneurysm. Uh, if we, we, we think it's very uh, risky um, because um, maybe with the, uh, with the features of um, mitral lobe or um, daughter, uh, daughter lobe or the very, uh, maybe very, uh, at a special location or at the, uh, or, or, or at a very irregular shape or is it, if it's hemodynamic features, uh, uh, we can show we can uh, you can see a very very low shear stress or very uh, at the bottom of the aneurysm uh, and and, uh, and there's some, some special location also indicates the high risk uh, the, the 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 machine can learn the uh, learn our our experience uh, from from Tiantan and the Xuan Wu and the Huashan Hospital and uh, and and the can learn from the cases, uh, and they know they can 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 judge with the uh, with the AI system to to give us a uh, evaluation. Uh, if we can, uh, I I can see the patient uh, in the outpatient de department. If the patient is if the if the, if the aneurysm is the high risk, I can give uh, give him suggestions of. Uh, Operation or open or in the vascular treatment, uh, but if some some young doctors or some doctors in local uh, hospital, they can't decide if the uh, if the patient is in on the high risk or on the lower risk. We can rely on the AI. You know, you know system. Uh, if, if, uh, actually, uh, before we use the design system. We can uh, we, we can think in my in my mind how to reduce the uh, flow in, at the neck or at the uh, bottom at the, the body of the aneurysm, but with the uh, with uh, with the flow uh, with, with the hemodynamic in, in simulation, we can see more clearly. Uh, uh, the, you, you can see clearly the. the uh, some special features of vascularization, uh, and uh, uh, if you use the system before the, uh, the, the, the before the treatment, uh, we can uh, design and help us to how many devices and which kind of device is the best for the for the choice. Uh, Thank you, Professor. Just wind up this session, but before I would like to ask Professor Yang one more question: that uh, in deciding whether an aneurysm is unstable. We found that eight parameters that you showed in the artificial intelligence system. But interestingly, I found that hypertension was missing as one of the parameters. Now, as you, you, we all know that hypertension is one of the main factors where we decide where, whether we should treat or leave an aneurysm behind. So why is that uh, AI system has not incorporated hypertension into one of its uh, learning parameters? Oh, you, this is a very good, good, very good question. Very good question. Hypertension uh, is, uh, is is our focus in, in the when we see the outpatient department. When we we, we firstly uh, must ask the patient to moderate his his his. his uh, blood pressure. Uh, we, we, if we use the AI system, we must uh, make the patient in the normal, moderate to normal blood pressure and make a, a, make a simulation with AI system. Uh, we have Dr. Jan and Sudhir wants to ask one question. Dr. Jan. Yeah, uh, good evening. This is Dr. Jan. Uh, I wanted to ask you one question about your artificial intelligence uh, for the evaluation of uh, risk of rupture of aneurysms. So when you are uh, building up a database for uh, doing this artificial intelligence system for uh, predicting the risk of rupture, you would have to follow up a set of patients who have unruptured intracranial aneurysms, and you may have to follow them to the point of rupture, which is not ethically possible. 
So how do you actually intend to build up the data a database for uh, finding the predictors of uh, aneurysm rupture risk? And in such events, when you uh, use uh, hemodynamic parameters like wall shear stress for evaluating the risk of rupture, again, you may be able to use a set of patients who have unruptured aneurysms and another set which have ruptured aneurysms. But the hemodynamics of ruptured aneurysms uh, may not be pointing directly to the risk factors that actually caused its rupture because the morphology and other parameters are likely to change after rupture. So how do you intend to uh, get across this barrier in creating the database for artificial intelligence? Okay, I, I, I get, get the database. You, 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 you mentioned the database. Uh, I, I, I think uh, the database set by uh, 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 retrospective the database. Uh, we we collect we collect many patients from our uh, clinical clinical data treated by uh, our patient and the in, in, in inpatient department. Uh, so, you know, we, we, we analyze the, the, the features with high hemodynamic or some uh, morphology morphology uh, features or clinical features uh, using our. Uh, previous database, but uh, after we set up uh, the database and uh, develop an AI system, we now develop, uh, develop a database, uh, another database of, for prospective uh, database. This database, we can, <clears throat> this, this database, we can observe the patient uh, uh, have observed the patient with the uh, whose who's, who's evaluation is low risk, uh, low risk patients, low risk aneurysms, and observed, we, we can see uh, one word, one word, one word, you, you, you can see with two years and how to see if our prediction is accurate. And it can give us the the very clear answer. Time now we wind up. I would go back to our chair, Dr. Ji Tang, to have his concluding remarks. Dr. Ji Thank you. Thank you, everyone. So, uh, talks about the, the skull based surgery and about the most advancing, the recent advancement in our neurosurgery. Thank you for to provide the two topics. I enjoy the topic and also the, the questions. So in the future, I think we can have a more time, an opportunity to share the, your the knowledge expertise. And thank you again. And also thank you for the organizers for this uh, opportunity. Thank you, thank you everyone. Thank you very much. In that case, I would wind up this officially. On behalf of the Education Committee of the SCNS and the President, Professor Yoko Kaito, I would like to sincerely thank both the speakers for today, Professor James K. Liu and Professor Yang Xinjian, and the Chair, Professor Ji Tang, for the time and support for the SCNS. We had very interesting sessions today, and we learned a lot from both the speakers and the chairs. Thank you, Dr. Liu Bun Seng, for being my co-host for today. A special word of gratitude to Professor Shubin and his colleagues who have arranged the webcast through WeChat channel in China, and also they are simultaneously translating this webinar into Chinese language. Today, we had nearly 5,045 neurosurgeons who watched this live. We, we are really indebted to Professor Shubin for that. Thank you all the distinguished faculties who joined. Till we meet next week, it is bye-bye from all of us.